On this week's podcast, we're talking about small-bodied Martin-style guitars, and our friends over at Dying Breed Music, one of this week's podcast sponsors, happen to have a bunch of Golden Era small-bodied Martins for sale right now. Lane over there has a 1931 Martin OM18 that just had a neck reset done by Dave Shepard. He also has an untouched 1935 Martin 00018 for sale right now. He's always getting and taking new consignments, so if you have a great guitar in your closet that you want to part ways with, Give him a call at 870-818-3434. His entire inventory is on GBase, but just to make things simple, you can go straight to dyingbreedguitars.com. That will get you both his store and his contact info. Check his stuff out. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal's 154th podcast. I am Jason Verlindy, the publisher of the Fretboard Journal magazine, as well as the Fretboard Journal podcast host. That is John Rauhaus playing in the background, as always. Fretboard Journal 39 is finally now mailing to everyone, including subscribers and stores worldwide. I hope you enjoy it. This issue, I'm not going to give away what is actually in it because you guys complain about it when I do any spoilers, but this issue has a bit of a Wilco theme that was totally unintentional but kind of cool. I did not interview Jeff Tweedy again, but we do have a feature in this issue penned by none other than Wilco's Nels Klein. I hope you enjoy it. I know I did. It was super informative. We also have a feature on former podcast guest Anthony Payne, who makes Harvester guitars down in Australia. I know Jeff Tweedy has at least one or two of those, and uh, I think you will like this issue. So uh, if you are a subscriber, thank you. Uh, It's going to be coming to your mailbox very shortly. I just got back from the first ever Vancouver International Guitar Festival last weekend. I had a great time up there. You know, we were at the LeConnor Guitar Show, what, six weeks ago? Then we came to the Vancouver International Guitar Festival. I didn't know what to expect. Both of these were first year shows, but it is so invigorating to see guitar shows that not only have excellent builders and great guitars on display, but they're well run and they have a nice, diverse crowd. And that weird thing that you can't really pinpoint, but just energy. Uh, it was fun to see Jason Costell and Grit Laskin and Linda Manzer make the most beautiful guitars you will ever have a chance to see, and then go walk around the corner to talk to the guy at Prisma Guitars who's building equally beautiful, in their own right, uh, electric guitars out of reclaimed skateboard decks, or to go talk to Doug Cower. There was something really cool about the mix of acoustic and electric guys. Uh, there were a couple fretboard journal former subjects there. Uh, including Linda and Grit and uh, uh, Al Beardsell. So I had a great time up there. Meredith Coloma, who threw the Vancouver show, if you are listening to this, you did a great job, and I hope this happens again uh, for years to come. Another place where you can find a great mix of acoustic and electric instruments alongside each other is the one and only Retrofret Vintage Guitars over in Brooklyn, New York. I've sung their praises before. It is truly one of the nation's great instrument showrooms as far as I am concerned. Where else can you find a 1965 Gibson Melody Maker, a 1936 Gibson L4 Archtop, or a 1966 Gibson ES335 12 string all alongside each other? They still have that 48D Angelico Excel that I mentioned a couple of weeks ago too. Go to retrofret.com to see all that they have in store. Please follow their Instagram if you haven't yet. And if you reach out to them to buy something or for a repair, Please tell them the Fretboard Journal podcast sent you. Now we are going to talk to Dina Bourgeois of Bourgeois Guitars and Eric Schoenberg of Eric Schoenberg Guitars. They are collaborating on the 30th anniversary edition of Eric's Brainchild, the soloist guitar. That is, of course, a Martin OM built the old way, but with a cutaway. Eric has been championing this thing for, well, 30 years now. And as you will hear, they decided to collaborate on doing it one more time together as a duo at the Fretboard Summit. How cool is that? I didn't even know that until we had this phone call. I hope you enjoy our talk. As always, if you like our podcast, give us a review on iTunes and feel free to drop us a line. If anyone needs to finally subscribe to the Fretboard Journal print edition, please use the coupon code podcast when you check out at fretboardjournal.com. I will take $5 off your order and you will get that new issue that I was just describing in your mailbox in about five to seven days. Thanks so much for listening, everybody, and please stay in touch. Obviously, guys, this is the the 30 year anniversary of the soloist, and I want to get to what you're doing this year to kind of celebrate that with these new guitars. But before we do that, let's go back in time, Eric, and and kind of tell me where you were 30 years ago, or I guess maybe it was 35 years ago when this idea first was hatched. Where was I? Well, I was <clears throat> still making part of my living as a performer, traveling around. And uh, 
Dana was one of the people that hired me. He had a little a, a club thing or a music series that he was doing hiring for. And that's what started off the relationship, really, between him and me. And was that club, uh, where was it, in Maine or in Boston? Where was that? It, it was in Maine, and Dana can will remember the. It was the Chocolate Church, as I recall. It was, Is that it right, was Dana? Chocolate, the, yep, it was a folk yeah. series. And folk uh, I was, uh, for a while, I had the job of uh, hiring hiring artists. <laughs> to come up and do weekend shows. So And you obvious you obviously were building guitars at this point too, Dana? I, w- I was building guitars and I was obviously aware of Eric uh, as a performer. Um, and uh, I think I was also aware that uh, he was uh, a part owner of the music emporium uh, in Cambridge, which uh, was one of the pioneer, you know, vintage music shops. Uh, and um, so at any rate, you know, that's just kind of kicked it off. Eric showed up, I think, at my house before the gig uh, with a with a carload of vintage guitars. And I think something needed tweaking uh, before performing. And, uh, and I tweaked it. And uh, the show went great. Everyone loved it. We had a good old time and uh, kept in touch, and and eventually I ended up um, uh, doing repair work uh, both for both for Eric and for the Music Emporium. Was that the show with Doc Watson, or was that a later one? Doc was a little bit later. That was later. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Eric, we... Eric came up for a Doc Watson show and ended up sitting in with. Uh, with 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 uh, brother Doc, mm. or brother Eric, nice. <laughs> He's with brother Doc, so cool, fantastic. And you know, at that point, I was deeply involved with performing wise, and you know, with the store, of course, playing vintage. I had like some of my old OM twenty eights. OMs and stuff that I was using as performing instruments. And uh, I had been getting Martin to make OMs again for the first time in uh, 40 years uh, as custom instruments. They, they had started let us do it if we would... Uh, order a certain number of guitars at a time and actually started off their uh, custom shop with OMs. We was that I have, you know, six or eight of them at a time or something. And, and just, I think what happened was I was looking for them to make them more like the older ones, which they didn't want to do under their own name. And Dana came up with the idea of asking them to uh, build them under the Schoenberg name. Mm -hmm. And having us spec them out very carefully and be part of the building. Because in those days, they uh, had forgotten some of what they used to know. And they were sort of felt like they had a... uh, had to make them more sturdy for their their warranty thing. So if we were going to do it with the old specs, they didn't want to warranty them. So that was the basis of really coming in with with Schoenberg guitars. And and so how many Schoenberg guitars did Martin make before the soloist came into play? Well, the soloist was the first. Oh, it was the first. Okay. So then... We started off with soloists. So... Because I... You know, Dana had made a guitar for me. I sort of thought it would be really neat to have an OM with a cutaway. And, uh... He enticed me with some incredibly beautiful wood. To get into this. 
at least we can make it as much like the older ones, but uh, with a cutaway. And, you know, their neck shapes varied a lot, but the, the neck shapes of the original ones, especially one in particular that they had re- repaired for me, uh, 1930, thereabouts. There was something very special about those neck shapes. So 1930 seems to be the year. <laughs> For the next. Yeah, that guitar was actually yeah. very early, 31. And then I see my OM is 29. So it was really for that uh, spread of time, maybe some really nice ones back to 28. And, but then in 31, they started, at some point, they started beefing them up the next because they were transitioning for maybe a decade from their old style of gut strung guitars to steel string. And they kept, they clung to as much as they could of the older style. And right at 1930 was a, a period in between the two where you had like a, a perfect mixture of switching from gut to steel. You get a modern guitar much lighter than what most of what certainly was available when we did our Schoenberg guitar thing Mm -hmm. in 85. There was nothing like that in uh, factory guitar. I should jump in here and and mention something that, uh, you know, back then, Eric was kind of like the king of the vintage OM. Uh, he, he, both between he and, you know, person, his personal collection and the music emporium, um, he tended to seek out any instruments that were available on the market and, 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 uh, and pick them up and turn them around. And, uh, you know, usually they needed some setup work at, at the very least. And, Almost um, always back then. Yeah. So, so I think that they they were tremendously undervalued. But Eric also had a very healthy teaching business going on in Boston, and had a number of uh, had a number of students who uh, you know who who he was uh, uh, who he who he introduced to to the OM guitar. And so, what I did with a lot of these guitars was uh, you know my end of it was the restoration part. Uh, getting them back to playability. So over a period of a few years prior to Schoenberg Guitars, a lot of vintage OMs had sort of gone through both of our hands. And we really got to, you know, compare, um, um, you know, very, very minute differences over, over a relatively short period of time. Did you always agree on what was the better guitar? Not always. Not always. We had different <laughs> points. Oh, of I don't know. But, I think uh, the really, the really good ones, I think, were pretty, were pretty obvious. Yeah. I mean, uh, the really good ones, generally, if they were in really original condition, they were great guitars. You know, the bad ones were the ones that had had, had been damaged or whatever, you know, or had been restored too many times. Wrongly, yes. Yeah. Uh, poorly, I guess. So, besides but it was, old specs and the cutaway, was there any other directive you gave Dana, Eric, in terms of what you wanted out of out of the soloist? Well, n- neck shape was a big part sure. of it, and it was just the awareness of the successful qualities of how they were built, and we were both interested in the fact that. Uh, the uh, vintage guitars were limited to the way they were doing it, and there was a lot of other options. For instance, different kinds of wood. You'd have rosewood and spruce or mahogany and spruce in the old ones. But there's uh, uh, a wealth of, of, like Martin only made, their only Koa guitars were all Koa. 
but uh, Koa with a fruit stop turns out to be an unseen, previously phenomenal quality you know, of sound. Yeah. And neck shape has been a major thing for me from the, from back to the beginning. There's most a lot of builders just don't get it. Yeah. And uh, it's the one one of the big failings out there, and I feel like um, <clears throat> that you know we do the guitars the way I like them. It turns out that everybody likes them. Almost everybody. I mean, there's variation in uh, like you can do the right neck shape, but they can be fatter or, or thinner or wider. Or, you know, and and nobody had built uh, new guitars with the string spacing of the old ones. Yeah, and still, like an electric guitar, you almost can never find an electric guitar with wide bridge spacing sure like the old guitars which is why i don't play electric like, <laughs> can't get it so back in the back in the back in the mid 80s there wasn't a great awareness of you know the specific requirements for finger style guitar a lot of the you know the sort of the chet atkins school of finger style you know were mostly playing classical guitars or electric you know, which were or electric uh, oh, but they had the wider spacing, but a, a lot of the a lot of the you know the contemporary guitars in that period didn't have the same spacing. So so the things that were really unique about what we did, you know, were were the um, you know this, there's something about the OM which is kind of a magical design. The long scale, there's a ratio of scale to the to, to surface area of the top you know, to air cavity, it just seems to work really nicely, particularly for finger style guitar. It's just the balance. The, the thing that we all liked about, about the OMs was the just incredible string to string and note to note balance. And I remember Tony Rice, you know, coming over to Eric's house one night and playing his guitars and, he, and, and saying, you know, this is it, man. This is exactly the sound I'm after. I just need it in a bigger box. Um, you know, of course, he's playing with playing with a pick. Sure. But um, and, you know, and what, his uh, his dread knight was altered a lot from original and made it more in that direction. Yeah. So. And, you know, and, and exactly. You know, that's really. A, go ahead. Go ahead. I, well, I was going to say, well, uh, he's really a jazz player. He needs every note on the guitar. Unlike a lot of, you know, flat pickers who came before him. So it's that note to note balance thing that he picked up on in the OM. That's what we were trying to do was trying to trying to get as many of those original qualities, you know, in into a contemporary guitar as possible. Um, and it's really like I, for like as a finger picking guitar, it's like making a classical guitar, seal string. Hmm. So you're like a classical guitar player. It's symphonic in a way. You have the bottom end and the high end. You're not just doing one or the other. You're doing it all at the same time, like a classical instrument. You know, an inside moving lines and that kind of thing. Right. So and you know, in those you... days, those days, most people thought a guitar had to be a dreadnought. I mean, the awareness nowadays of of the the values of a smaller guitar has all come s since then. And it really started off with getting the OM concept accepted out in the world. Yeah. And they all had one eleventh, sixteenth inch nuts. Mm -hmm. And we had to start, in selling our guitars, we had to start convincing people that they're going to like it with the wider spacing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they would fall in love with the guitar and then say, well, but I'll, I'm going to keep it, you know, in its case and play it special times. It sounds so good. But I'm going to play my old D28. Mm -hmm. 
remember Linda Waterfall was one former of the day, mm-hmm. and that. Yeah. And two or three months later, she says, "I haven't touched my D28. It's been under the bed the whole time, and I can't go back." She's still playing that guitar thirty, what thirty years wow. later. I'm curious, Dana, uh, when you built that first prototype, how did the cutaway uh, affect the tone uh, or the volume in your ears, to yours? Well, the, the, whole, the whole concept was to, ha- to make a minimal cutaway, to change, you know, to give the player a little more access, but to do it in, the, in a way that had the least effect on that perfect... Um, Air cavity. Sort of, yeah, the air cavity, you know, surface area of the top, tail length kind of formula. And so at the time, Eric owned an original uh, Selmer. And his idea was to put a Selmer type cutaway on an OM. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like a great idea. That was the first thing that I drew. And it looked pretty cool. But back then, I couldn't make that sharp a bend. <laughs> so without breaking we we're making guitars out of Brazilian rosewood. Yeah. And you don't want to you don't want to lose too many sets. So uh right, that's so, quite a bend. And the <laughs> McAfee's were laminated, so it made it much easier to get that bend. Yeah, and Taylor has these high tech benders that can do it now under enormous pressure and heat. Um and uh totally automated, but you know, we didn't want to lose any sides, so it ended up being a much softer cutaway. But its only difference was really aesthetic. Um, you know, it's and we we I both agreed we, that we even like it better this way. Yeah, a little bit curve curvier. It's um, um so I was going to say over the years I've built many cutaway and non cutaway OM. And boy, I can tell you, there's not a heck of a lot of difference in tone, you know, if you build the top to be properly responsive. Um, You know, the bigger differences are, you you get much bigger differences with wood selection, you know, than you do with... Yeah, people ask me that question a lot. Oh, it's got a cutaway. And my response is always, it's a completely moved issue. There's no way of knowing, really accurately how that affects the sound because every guitar sounds so different Mm -hmm. and we've had plenty of incredible sounding cutaway guitars OMs you know Schoenberg's and great sounding non-cutaway ones you know one guitar like Dana was saying the choice of wood and something one guitar might be a big full sounding guitar and so the cutaway you know isn't affecting it and another guitar might you know, have a different quality. The one thing I would think, you know, uh, in a in a sort of funny way, I've always thought of it as the twelve fret guitars are are fuller sounding, but they don't have as nice a high end in general. Hmm. Right, not as bright a high end. And some of that is the longer body. So our cutaway guitars, one half of it is a shorter body for the high end, and one side of it is the longer body for the low end. Not very so I, accurate, but it's a fun thought. Way of looking at it. I like Go to ahead. think, you know, looking back, you know, that we had something to do with uh, uh, the popularity that, that the OM has today. Uh, for most manufacturers, most American guitar builders, the OM is either their, their, you know, the second or their first most popular guitar or, you know, body style. Yeah. And boy, back in the, back in the day when we started, <coughs> Martin had just reissued, probably hadn't made more than 20 OMs before they started you know, working on the Schoenberg product and a handful of, of other makers, you know, in, 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 including Franklin Guitars had, had made a couple OMs before we did, but Franklin you know, we might be able... 01. Yeah. Yeah. 
but we were able to we were able to advertise you know not only a guitar company but 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 a specific product and uh you know back back in the old days of uh Fretz magazine there were very few advertise very few advertisers before they went out of business we were one of about a dozen guitar companies you know who advertised in Fretz of course our ads were dinky little you know uh six page ads but um um, it was kind of like the beginning of the boutique guitar company thing, and also the beginning of the of the you know the the awareness of the OM. Sure. You know, pro- we did some so, very nice ads actually. Yeah. Yeah. Really, we took that very seriously. I like to think that you know, the first OM Martin made since the old ones <laughs> they ended at some point in 30, 1934 was when I'd ordered with Matty Umanoff uh, at the Folklore Center in New York. We ordered 12 in the 60s. And they hadn't done that, done an OM since, or I mean before. Wow. And then the next ones they made were for the my uh, project with the Music Emporium. And we advertised those a lot. And then you'll see, like, after that, after we started ordering so many of them, we were getting a lot of uh, positive feedback, and you'd see, oh, man, Lynn Brothers, we're going to order some. We better order some, and then other people, and then finally, you know, Martin made a hundred. Our early OM forty fives, how we started the project. We had ours, and then Martin made a hundred bodies and stashed them away for a while, and finally released them as their own model in the late 70s. That was the start of the OM. Before all of that, it didn't exist except for Nick Kukic, I believe, which is Franklin Guitars. He was a very smart guy on that score. Eric, you Pardon? can we go back a bit and can you talk a little bit about, I know you've mentioned it earlier, but the kind of the business relationship you had with Martin over the years building these, especially, you know, it's, it's definitely, you're probably the only company where they would brand it as yours, but build it in house. And then Dana is supplying some of the supplies. Can you walk me through how that evolved? They've done it before. I mean, they had made, um, guitars for Ditson. Oh, sure. Of course. Yeah. Without their name on it and that kind of stuff. Sure. Way back. Yeah. But in modern times, <clears throat> Um, I guess it was a period of time when we came along that was a real downturn in the uh, acoustic guitar world, guitar sales. And we were friends with, I was friends with Chris Martin. I had been going to the Martin factory for many years, since I was a kid, actually. And I think... He kind of felt that uh, this is, it's just a good time to redo this concept. So it was Dane's concept of taking the prototype we made and going to the factory and having them assemble the guitars and finish them. And they were just certain things that they weren't comfortable doing because they hadn't done them since the 30s. Wooden binding, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, Pyramid bridges. We were using a lot. We had to do that. And And then we supplied the bridges. We supplied bridges. We bent the binding initially and sent it to them. And we would bend the sides because uh, their their uh, bending techniques depended on having thicker sides and being able to sand them. But we were using valuable rosewood, Brazilian rosewood, and we had thinner specks, so we, so we could take I mean, Dana would do that, and take more care, and then we added the concept. 
to me, it seems like a perfect, a perfect, uh, un, undone previously meeting of the individual builder and the special things that he can do. And the, uh, um, things that a factory does. Factories will just take a pile of tops, for instance, and take one off the top. I mean, they can't do more than that uh, and be a company the size of Martin. And everything would be the same specs, whereas uh, Dana could... Uh, we could select each piece of wood. Dana could... Uh, tap on it and, and that flex it to see, see, well, my phone's going doing a little weird thing for a moment here. This is another call. Yeah, I, I can pick up what, what we did is we supplied the wood, uh, and I thickness the top. And, and then when the guitars got to a certain stage of production, I voiced, I went down and voiced the tops. Now, I don't want to oversimplify guitar making, but it sounds like you did a lot of the heavy lifting. Was there ever the thought of you just doing the whole guitar process from soup to nuts? Well, that's what I ended up doing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of where it ended up. But it, it, didn't, it really wasn't that much that I did. I mean, I sent them a bunch of, sent them a bunch of parts, which they used, you know, you know, the efficiency of their, of their factory system to assemble. And I just made some of some of the critical calls in terms of the bracing, you know, actually. Yeah. The bracing was done at Dana's shop. And because one thing they were a bit surprised at the quality of the wood we were using for braces back when they looked at the first prototype, hmm. actually they were amazed. It was a quarter song, and split piece of wood. And so, and that, because of the better wood, we can make the braces smaller. They were stronger. That's hand-building concepts. Yeah. And and TJ made those pyramid bridges, right? Uh, I don't TJ remember who made, made the bridges at first. I think I made them at first, and TJ ended up making them later on. Uh-huh. And then later we had Mike Chemnitzer making our bridges. Okay. Actually. Later on, I, I, after a few years, I left the partnership, and TJ came in and filled my role. Right. And he was already pretty dang familiar with what we were doing. <laughs> and he'd yeah, done a bunch of it, right? Yeah, yeah, he'd done a bunch of it with me, and um, so um, so Eric has sort of continued. I, th I think I think you guys did a little bit with Martin, and then and then stopped, and then Eric has kind of continued the the relationship with uh, with with various other luthiers over the years. You know, producing guitars. Uh, under his brand and, you know, to his, under his sort of general view of what finger style guitars ought to be like. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Eric is kind of the marketing end of it and the, the, um, um, I'm, I'm searching, I'm searching for a war for a word, but it, but, you know, it's sort of like the really, conceptual guru of keeping the concept of, I think what I think Guru is the, yeah Guru is the perfect description. <laughs> Eric had a vision. Eric had a vision yeah. of uh, of what a finger style guitar should be like, and he's still pursuing it. Yeah. Which and kind of leads us to our re go ahead. I, I what was I going to say? It was um, I forget. <laughs> also, besides being Guru, it was like. Uh, the guy with the whip. <laughs> but also, 
I was going to say that, you know, this was like, you know, you buy a uh, the best clarinet, you're going to buy a buffet special something or other that the professionals use and et cetera for all the kinds of instruments, things that are made. So this is made for someone who really plays. Mm -hmm. It's not for someone who sits around with a flat pick and pumps out chords, you know. I mean, it works great for that when people do that with, uh, but, and it's a primarily fingerstyle guitar, but makes a fantastic flat picking guitar. I mean, Scott Nygaard loves his little double O Schoenberg. And, yeah. But it's, all so the not, other guitars previously were designed for flat pickers, basically. The narrow neck came out, came about for the jazz guys in the uh, 40s, you know, the swing bands. And makers just kept to those like skinny little necks for people to comp out chords and play fast leads. Mm -hmm. And everybody else had to just adopt their own playing to those standards. I'm getting a little off track. No, no. I'm curious in terms missed, in terms of the soloist, what production numbers were were are we looking at uh, in terms of how many were built, you know, by Martin versus the individual builders and just in general? I think we probably Martin did about 250. Okay. Guitars, and then I had a, another. We created a Schoenberg guitars like mini factory. Wow four or five people building it. Julius Borges and John Slobod running that show until I moved out west and that that fell apart. So that was back in Massachusetts. Sure. And then let's talk about the the anniversary model. Uh, you're going to make 12 of them. Uh, the woods are not Brazilian like back in the day. Can you kind of, Dana, tell us about what you did and why? Well, I realized that we were coming up on an anniversary. Uh, we ha I had just put out a 40th anniversary guitar, uh, just like the 40th anniversary of my building uh, the previous year, and uh, realized that it was the 30th anniversary of the of the Schoenberg soloist, and it was kind of a um, the instrument really that sort of put me on the map um, and I felt it was worth uh, commemorating and, and uh, I ran into Eric actually last year at the fretboard summit and I That's told where Eric idea of, started. Oh, cool. <laughs> Go ahead. I told Eric of my idea and I said I would really like him to be involved um, you know since I left uh, Schoenberg Guitars I've used the name Soloist for an, o, an OM cutaway. Um, and actually, just for a certain style of OM cutaway, I only use it for a particular, you know, for a guitar that's that's made a certain kind of way. I also make, you know, what we call just an OMC, which could be dressed up in any, in any kind of way the customer wants it, but the soloist is a particular style. And over the years, you know... <clears throat> We get batches of wood, and every once in a while, there's you know special woods um, come in, and it's like, wow, this stuff is so it's so cool. We ought to set it aside and do something with it. I happen to get a batch of uh, German spruce with a very heavy bear claw figure, and it's it not just, very it, common at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this wood was just way over the top, and I remembered that you know we made a bunch of Schoenberg, original Schoenberg soloists with, with wood like that. And uh, uh, Eric was particularly fond of German spruce and we both liked the bear claw. And I thought, wow, I bet, you know, let's, let's do this. And there we, I already had a lot of Brazilian OMCs kind of out on the market. I wanted to do something a little bit different and also put it in a different price range than a Brazilian guitar. And I happened to get in a batch of old growth uh, Coca Bolo with some very nice, you know, close grain 
that kind of had a brazilian kind of look and it sounded really good. Some coca ball I'm not terribly wild about, but and I had sort of enough to do a dozen guitars between, you know, between the tops and the backs. And so that's kind of how, how the guitar came about. And then I built a prototype and brought it to the, um, to the fretboard summit and Eric played it. And his first comment was, yeah, but you didn't get the neck right. <laughs> 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 so, that initiated a, pro- a process of me, you know, kind of, well, Eric sent me some photos of a guitar that he had, and I did a couple of different, you know, modifications on a sample neck and, uh, you know, shipped it out to Eric. The first time it was, well, that's better, but it's not quite right. And so I kind of like drifted away, you know, from, um, you know, from, from this whole sort of neck vibe that I that I'd gotten um you know from my association with Eric and uh and uh so I ended up making two guitars for Eric and and, and was pleased and relieved to hear that the next came out just fine so <laughs> at least at least within the uh within the, the you know the variance range that you know one would right. expect of a of, of, of a word. guitar from from the right period. Yeah. Right. And are these only sold at Eric's shop or everywhere? Everywhere. Um, yeah. yeah well, they were available for 11 shops. Yeah. yeah. Got it. So, and we had know, um, one of our dealers sold three of them. Um, wow. You know, so it's, you know, some some of the dealers some dealers specialize in the high end of our line and some dealers specialize in the low end of our line and sort of in between. So there you know there's been a smattering. I think there's a, there's a couple of them left out there here and there, um, but some, some um, most of them have sold through. We produced most of them in the I guess in the first couple months of this year. Got it. I think I'd, here we have the last one still for sale. It's either number 11 or 12. Yeah, I think Eric got the first and the last. Nice. The first and the last. The first one is mine. <laughs> and, and Eric, I got to ask, because, I mean, this is just a, a blip in the whole Schoenberg Guitars manufacturing side that we've talked about. But, um, you know, who are you using now for builds and... Um, Tell me, because pretty much everyone you cherry pick to build guitars for you is ends up being the next great big, you know, well known luthier. So, who, who are you using right now? Uh, Bruce Sexauer, Randall Kramer up in Truckee, um, James Russell makes a few. In a, he's in Redding, California. Okay. Robert Anderson in Victoria, British Columbia, has made some of the best ones, some phenomenal guitars. Um, John Slobot still does, he has a lot of his own offer, orders, but he'll stick one in for us every once in a while. It takes a couple of years, but has a couple of really superb guitars because he, he worked for us for sure. In our shop back in Massachusetts, for all. Um, but I taught him everything he knows. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. I learned a lot from John. He worked. He worked for me, uh, actually, before he worked for Schoenberg Guitars. So. And after as well, right? And after, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, he went back there. Yep. Yeah. So. It's um, it's a small club. Yeah. And and how do you decide well, but, which builder does which build, Eric? Well, you know, uh, some of it is, first of all, in deciding on a person. At first, I had to talk people in. Now I've had people actually want to do it. <laughs> Good. Uh, it's more of a personality thing. It's being able to, and willing 
to do something somebody else's way, which a lot of builders won't do. They have their uh, point of view and they stick to it. And I'll say that every, like Dana says, every single one of them has completely changed their building around Hmm. from what it used to be. Because they constantly get proven, basically, that this old style is better. (laughs) I've had several builders say, oh, you know, those scallop braces, they they just don't sound very good. This other concept is much better, straight braces. And then they play a couple of Schoenbergs, and they sound incredible. And then I remember Bruce, Sex Hour, way back. (laughs) He played one, and it was amazing. He says, do you mind if I try to build one like yours? See what it's like. And he made a guitar, and it was incredible. And ever since, he's been making variations of Schoenberg guitars under his own name, even. Yeah. Julius uh, Borges was one also, and, you know, Slobod, and uh, and including Martin. Since now they're doing their authentic models, they're basically working towards what I was trying to get them to do from the beginning. So it's been amazing. That I think the, the lesson is you can't, continually start from the beginning. You have to learn from what's gone on the, in the past. And it takes a player, someone who understands, you know, what, how a guitar works or something, to uh, take what, from, from what has existed in the past, from what we've learned in the past, and use what works and this, and get rid of what doesn't work yeah, and focus and, and continue the learning process that kind of stopped in the guitar building world. And, uh, <clears throat> whereas it, you see the young players nowadays who are incredible, better than anybody ever played way back, you know, in our field. And it's because they've learned from, they learn what people in the past have learned, and then they add their own thing on top of it. Unbelievable players now. Yeah. And it's a similar thing with the guitar building. And that's how I've always viewed it. You learn from the past and uh, add, or you, you know, you take a lot of old. You know, this is what creativity often is like. It's not pure creativity. It's you take a bunch of things that have existed and combine them in new ways. Mm -hmm. And I think our guitars have been, you know, I I play lots of handmade guitars. I don't, you know, I'm very biased, I know, but I still like our guitars better than all the others. Sure. (laughs) <laughs> They've got your neck. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's a sound, you know. It's a sound. I mean, it's much... It's open. I mean, these guitars uh, are alive. They're not... I mean, when we started, most guitars were... Almost every guitar was overbuilt. Yeah. They may all have been overbuilt. They just ended up that way. And uh, back 30 years ago, we, I, I, I would take these guitars around and uh, expose players to them over and over again. And I remember showing the braces to one of the Canadian builders who's famous. And they looked inside the guitar. I gave him a mirror and looked inside the guitar at the braces and they nearly like fell over. You can't do that. The guitar's not going to last. And then all you have to do is hold up a Martin from 19, even 1920. And that's in perfectly good health. And to dispel that mistake. 
and you're just letting every piece of wood breathe fully. The braces are are light. The scalloping does something. It may be not logical, but it really creates a a quality of sound. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Very cool. Dana, what else do you have brewing right now? <laughs> well, I don't have much more to add to what what uh, <laughs> to what Eric said. Yeah. Um, but I, but I've kind of I've really kind of followed in those footsteps. Um, you know, taking it kind of kind of in my own direction, and uh, I've always you know revered the sound of the vintage guitars and tried to understand what made them tick, and you know tried to figure out how I can build a a brand new contemporary guitar that sounded as good. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it'll never happen as there's something that happens with aging. And, uh, but, uh, it, but it's a worthy quest. I'm back. By so uh, number that. one from, a, uh, pardon? I was going to say, and I, and I'll just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> my, I was going to add that my, to what you're saying, Dana, that my uh, number one of, of our commemorative soloist has been yeah. sitting in, uh, when I'm not playing it, it's sitting with the tone right on for weeks. Oh, okay. Starting it on its process. And one other technical fact that going back to, uh, to one of the questions you asked about the woods, it might be serendipity, but. Uh, the combination of German spruce and cocobolo has a very particular uh, effect. I mean, cocobolo is being really stiff. If if you use a piece of Adirondack, you can sometimes get a guitar that's all all punch and no body, whereas German spruce can have a very beautiful, more singing, fatter. Sound like a high end, even across the whole board. So I think there's something with these guitars, these twelve guitars, that there's it's a lot of power. It's got punch, which I think is a very necessary part of a guitar, but it also has richness and fullness. It's a real uh, combination of, of of the best of parts makes great parts are greater than the, than the parts. The whole is greater than the parts. Is it, as a result. Are these the first soloists with that exact wood combination? Oh, I doubt it. <laughs> We've done so many. But uh, Yeah, I think I, I've made that combination before, but, um, uh, you know, the thing about making 12 guitars is you get a, you, you know, a kind of from 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 batches of wood that are similar, you get a you just get a chance to sort of explore it kind of deeply. That's you know, the only way to, to know. A one off. Yeah. All the experience that you can accrue just makes them better and better. I mean, it's just learning from the past and from your own past. Just it's uh, the number of years of experience, as long as you're paying attention, is what's going to really make them work. Yeah. Well, on that note, guys, thank you so much. You betcha. Thank you. Fun chat. Thank you. All right. 